How you doing, Rock family? Happy Sunday, happy Sunday. Welcome, welcome, Palm Sunday. We are going to have a great message today, great encouragement, and hopefully God's going to give you incredible vision for your life, incredible vision. I'm Miles McPherson, pastor of the Rock Church. I'm so excited to give this message to you. So we're going to get on our knees and pray every week. Come on now, get out of your bed, roll out of your, off the couch, get off the chair. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you so much that next week is Easter. We are so excited and we pray that you bless us today, encourage us today. Give us vision for the purpose, the prophetic purpose you have for our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's go. Let's get your Bibles out. Let's get your Bibles out. We are going to be, we're going to start in Revelation today. Woo. Let's get your Bibles out. On the count of three, say word. One, two, three. Say word, word, come on, get out, get out your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 19, and then we're going to be in Luke 19. Revelation 19, we're just going to look at one verse in Revelation 19. I'm so excited, welcome, welcome. Listen, hit the share button, we want to get this word out. Get Luke, uh, Revelation 19, the last book of the Bible, and then go to hit the share button. I want to say hello to everybody out there. What's up, New York? What's up, New York? All my people's back in New York. Hopefully you're not freezing too bad. Luke 19. Uh, this verse is so uh, powerful to me. I just want to start out by reading it and talking about for a minute to set up what we're going to talk about today. It says in Revelation 19, the last part, it says, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus, what Jesus has been doing and declaring in your life is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, every single one of you out there has a prophetic purpose. A purpose to declare the kingdom of God. God has created you to declare the kingdom of God, not only in what you say, but how you live your life and how your life is transformed into the image of God. And the testimony of what Jesus is doing in your life is is evident of the spirit of prophetic purpose in your life. In other words, when you get transformed and you start to change, God is declaring to the world, this is what I had intended for this purpose, this person to be. And here is the prophetic purpose that is going and how it's going to impact your life. As we finish this series called Burden of Proof, we've been talking about what is the evidence or proof that God's burden is your burden. And today we're going to talk about the fact that the evidence is when you humbly fulfill the prophetic purpose of your life. When you will say, Lord, I know you've called me for a purpose, you've gifted me for a purpose, you have a plan in my life, and it is to declare the glory of God in the world. And I want to humbly walk in that. In other words, when I get up every day, Lord, I want to fulfill what you have for me. And when you fulfill what you have for me, it is going to be part of the plan that you already, that you Mapped out before the foundations of the earth. The Bible says that we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared beforehand. Lord, I want to fulfill that. I don't want to deviate to the left. I don't want to deviate to the right. I don't want to have my own ideas. I don't want to think I'm smarter than you. I want to fulfill what you have for me. Three things. One, it's going to require the humility to submit to God's timing. The humility to submit to God's Timing, everything has a season. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Number two, to humbly live a life of self-denial. If I'm going to fulfill God's prophetic purpose on my life, if I'm going to fulfill the declaration, the declarative purpose, the declarative power that God has on my life, I have to live a life of self-denial. And number three, whoo, this is the hard one. I'm going to humbly, I have to, I have to have the humility to endure being misunderstood. Especially in our world today, it's so us versus them. If you do anything that looks like you're on the side of those people, you get canceled. We're going to talk about that because I got canceled a few months ago. I'm going to talk about that. So you have to humbly submit to God's timing, 
You have to humbly live a life of self-denial and you have to have the humility and be willing to be misunderstood. You can't be living life to please everybody else. You've got to please God and sometimes everybody's not going to understand that. Okay, in the story, Jesus is going to ride into town on a colt and they're going to lay the palms. It's Palm Sunday. They'll lay the palms down and they're going to say, Hosanna in the highest and they're going to declare him the king and there's going to be some, some, some opposition. He is fulfilling the declarative purpose, the prophetic purpose of his life. God, he was sent for this purpose to die. And he had a prophetic timeline. He is fulfilling it according to the time code. So as we read this story and learn these three principles, I want you to be thinking about your life. Because there is a prophetic purpose on your life. And every time God does something in your life, he is doing it according to his purpose on your life. But if you're not in tune with his purpose on your life, you're not in tune with the burden that he has for you and the burden that he has for the people that you are going to reach. But if you can say, Lord, I want to be in tune with your purpose for my life. I want to be in tune with what you have prophetically declared my life to be. I want that to be the burden on my heart. And that's going to be the proof you're walking with God. Let's look. Let's read. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. It says, when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called Olivet, he sent two disciples saying, go into the village in front of you. And when, where on entering you find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat, untie it and bring it to me. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. Um, the first point is that... If you are going to humbly fulfill the prophetic purpose of your life, which has to be the burden on your heart. Now, when I say burden, I mean this has to be what you are bound to, what you are compelled to. Lord, I want to know why I'm here. There's probably eight things you can do with your life. God, what is the one you have for me? What's going to maximize the kingdom of God? Number one. You need the humility to submit to God's timing. You need the humility to submit to God's timing. Galatians 4.4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Jesus was born in a manger. It was a time to be poor. (laughs) Then he fled to Egypt. There was a time to flee. Then when he was 12, he was, and before 12, he learned the Bible, the Torah. There was a time to learn. Then he was 12 years old. He was in a synagogue debating with the Pharisees and the scribes. There was a time to kind of test his knowledge. Then he had a business. He was a carpenter. There was a time to have a business and Grow up and experience life as a man until he was 30 years old. Then he got baptized. It was a time to get baptized and be tempted by the devil 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. Then there was a time to pick his disciples. Then there was a time and season for him to have, do miracles and teach and do his three ministry for three years. There's a time and a season for everything in your life. What season are you in? For all y'all who are in your 20s and you're not married yet, there's a time to learn about who you are, it's time to meet somebody that maybe you're going to marry. Then there's a time that you're going to have kids and have little kids, and then that time is going to grow up to teenagers, and then, then they're going to leave the house. Then there's going to be a time to be a parent of an adult. My daughter, my oldest daughter, said something to me a couple of years ago. It was, it was, I don't know what she was dealing with. She had this revelation, and she said, Dad, you know what? She was 30-something years old at the time. And she's still 35, but she was maybe 31. She said, Dad, you know what? I, I, I never th- realized how difficult it must be to be a parent of adult children. It was really it was like, <laughs> she must have had a V8. What? <laughs> how did she, what was she thinking about that? But it was so insightful for her. I think she probably was dealing, man, I, I, I imagine she was thinking about herself. I must be difficult because <laughs> she was. But she said, she, and there's a season when you have little kids, there's a season, teenage kids, there's a season, and then adult kids to be a parent. It's a season. 
It's a season. We were doing a FaceTime with my kids the other day, and, they, and my daughter said, so how's it like being home by yourself? And we're like, we're loving it. <laughs> it's a season. Me and my wife, we got, we're empty nesters. It's a season. There's a time for everything in your life. And by the way, those seasons are all according to God's prophetic purpose in your life. And in each season, your life is going to declare something about the kingdom a little differently. What season are you in? Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8 says, for everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what was planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to tear down, a time to sow. A time to keep silent, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. Now, Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. Solomon was the richest man in the world, and he was writing his reflections on living life without God. Living life for yourself. And he's like, here's what I realized under the sun. And at the very end of this book, he's realizing the only thing that matters is that you obey God and keep his commandments. So he's just observing in life. Some people die, some people live. Some people hate, some people love. That's what he was saying. But in reality, that's life. There's seasons that we all go through. The question is, what season is you? Is your life in? There's a lot of people living in the past. You ain't in high school anymore. Grow up. You ain't in college anymore. You're not in your 30s anymore. Grow up. What is the season that you're in now? And not in your physical age, your emotional age, your financial, all that's relevant. But what season are you in in God's prophetic calendar? For your life. Jesus was born, time to be born, time to flee, time to learn, time to go into synagogue and, 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 and test his stuff on the adults, time to have a carpentry business, time to uh, be baptized and go into the wilderness. But now it's time to die. He missed it for three years. His disciples still didn't seem to be ready. The world wasn't fixed. His own people would crucify him and shout for his crucifixion. But he said, it's time to die. It's time. It didn't make sense to everybody else. We're going to talk about being misunderstood in a minute. It didn't make sense to everybody else. It's like, wait a minute, you could still do more miracles, still heal more people, make more disciples. He said, no, 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 no. It's time to die. You should pray for God all the time. God, what time is it? I had a um, friend of mine that played with, with the charges die a month ago. God told me the day before he, uh, two days before he died, I hadn't seen him in two years. And God said, you need to check on him. And I didn't. And then I read two days later he was dead. He died. And I called his wife, who I've known both of them for almost 40 years. And she said he's been in a home for over a year. And this was a guy who was a monster, strong as an ox, 70 years old, ripped. And shriveled up, CTE got to him, and he's been in a home for over a year. The, it, it just makes you think there's a time to be incredibly in great shape, and then there's another season. And when people close to you die, you start to reflect on what season of life you're in because it's coming. And then my wife, and as soon as I told my wife, she was in shock. And she looked at me and says, I don't want that to happen to me because I've had so many concussions I can't count since I was 10 years old. When I was 10 years old, I got knocked out in the first game. And have had more than I could count. And we just cherish this time. What season are you in? God has a prophetic calendar on your life. You were born and you would die. You're going to die. 
Mark Twain said, the, the most two important days of your life is the day you were born and the day you find out and you realize why you were born. But then there's another day. It's when you die. Jesus said, it's time for me to die. And so he rides in and he understood this was the time. Number two, you need to humbly live a life of self-denial. Look at verse 32. So they went away and found the colt just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And that was the end of that. <laughs> and they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the colt. They set Jesus on it, and he rode along. And they spread cloaks on the road as he was drawing near. And already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began rejoicing and praise God with a loud voice with all the mighty works that he had, they had seen, saying, blessed is the king, king, king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Why is a king on a cult? King would be on a horse. Where is his army? Where is where's all the power? Where is all... The, the pump, he's humbly on a donkey. He is fulfilling his prophetic purpose. Zechariah 9.9. 9. Zechariah uh, preached when they were trying to rebuild uh, the temple. If you remember a few weeks ago, I talked about Nehemiah building the wall. Well, Nehemiah was building the wall around the temple that took 20-something years to build because they started the temple and then they for 16 years didn't build it. And one of the prophets who was declaring and encouraging the people to rebuild it and finish the completion of the temple was Zechariah. And Zechariah preached, rebuild the temple to prepare for the Messiah. And here's what he wrote. Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous in heaven, salvation is he. Humble. Woo. Humble. Humble, humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Humble. Jesus is like, I, I, don't, I don't need all that. I'm, I'm just a humble servant. Remember, he, he said he didn't come to be served. He came to serve and give his life as a ransom. It's time to give his life. If you are going to fulfill God's prophetic call, your life was intended to be a declarative statement to the world of the kingdom of God. Your life was intended to be a declarative statement that when people look at you, they see the glory of God. They see the purpose, the forgiveness of God, the love of God, the patience of God, the power of God. When they look at you, they see God working, the testimony of Jesus in your life, what he's doing in your life, what he's saying in your life. When they see you, they see God declaring to them his love. So here's Jesus Saying, the only way I'm going to do that is to be humble. And I'm going to ride in on a donkey. And not only am I going to ride in on a donkey to declare the glory of God humbly, I'm going to fulfill the prophetic declaration from Zechariah. That I'm coming in on a donkey. So here's my question to you. Are you living a life of self-denial to yourself but submission to God? Are you living a life of self-denial to yourself? in submission to God, his timing, his manner. In other words, you are pro proceeding through your life according to God's timing and in a manner that is consistent with God's purpose in your life. And number three, this is, this is the hard one. This is probably the most challenging one. You must have the humility and be willing to be misunderstood. You are going to do things in the name of Christ that people are going to go, I don't know why you did that. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them don't say that. They are sinning. They are wrong. You are not the Messiah. You are not the Savior. And Jesus said, 
I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would cry out. <laughs> now, if, that, if they don't, if they be quiet, the stones will declare who I am. Um, we live in a culture where you will be canceled. And if you are going to follow God, God is going to have you do things where people are going to misunderstand you. So you have to have the humility to endure being misunderstood. In other words, if you walk around and live your life thinking, what are they going to say? 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 You're going to have a problem walking with God. Why? Because the world doesn't have the same mindset of God. Our election cycle was so vicious. Still, politics is vicious. But our last presidential election cycle was so, so vicious. And it, it was like at the, I had a railroad track near my house. And we could hear the trains every day. And we would go play in the train tracks, do crazy stuff. And what we knew that that third rail, and I don't know if you know anything about trains, but there's, a, there's tracks where the wheels are on. And then there's a third rail, which is about that high above the ground. And that's where the train would get its electricity, would have a, a metal thing that rode along. And that, would empower, that powered the train. And we were always told that if you touched that, you would just die. Now, I don't know if that's true because I don't know of anybody who did die. But that's what we believe. You touch that third rail... You're going to die. And, and we would always go near it and, you know, hear it buzz it. It would bzzz, And it was, you know, all these vaults and stuff, right? And you hear about people dying. Obviously, I never did it. I'm here alive. But the third rail is a metaphor for don't touch that topic or you're going to get toasted. That's what our election cycle was like. You better be careful you say this president candidate name, this president candidate name, or you're going to get toasted. The Bible says pray for everybody. The Bible says pray for elected officials. So what you going to do? If you pray for this elected official, that means you must have voted for them and believed everything they believe. If you pray for this elected official, that must mean you voted for them and, and you everything they believe. That means if you pray for this one, that means all these people are going to hate you and that you can't be a Christian. There's no way you can be a Christian and you can cancel. Woo. It's crazy. So you got to walk down the middle or say, Lord, what do you want me to do? So my, my policy in general is to not do politics because people go crazy. I don't talk about who I vote for, never did, and won't. But I made a statement about the new president, new vice president, being new vice president. It wasn't, hey, I'm glad, I, who, here's who I voted for, nothing like that. It was like, this is who they are. And all hell broke loose. You voted for them, you believe in abortion. You, and it was insane. People that I've known all my life. Wrote me off. Now, did I declare who I voted for? Nope, never will because of that very reason. I believe in life. I preach abundant life, created life, designed life all my life. But somebody else read into a statement and then, and a Christian, by the way, and made an accusation. And all these people ran with it. You have, and, and, and it's really sad. As believers, how we can believe something that we hear that's not true and run with it that quick. When you walk with God, God's going to have you love people who other people don't love. Pray for people who other people can't stand. He's going to have you forgive people who other people don't want to forgive. And you are going to be vilified for doing that by some people who can't see past their own issues. But you have to be faithful because God's blessing is on the other side of you obeying him. Look what happened with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, who never sinned, actually, be, he didn't get accused, he became sin. 
He became sin. If you are going to fulfill your prophetic purpose, oh, you're going to get blamed for stuff. You're going to get misunderstood. You're going to get accused of stuff. That's what happens. First Peter, First Peter 2.21, for to this you will call because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Um, he said, Lord, when they smacked him, he didn't respond. When they spit on him, he didn't respond. When they cursed at him, he didn't respond. When they hit him at rods, he didn't respond. Why? He knew this was his season. He knew it's time. He says, I know none of these people understand who I am. Matter of fact, when they were nailing him to the wood, what did he say? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. They're misunderstanding the whole situation. But I forgive them anyway. I forgive them anyway. If you are going to fulfill the God's prophetic purpose in your life, you have to understand the timing, where you're at. Is it time to speak, a time not to speak? Is it time to preach, a time not to preach? Is it time to learn, a time to teach? What season are you in? You have to be able to live a life of self-denial. The world's mentality is get everything you can. God's mentality is it all belongs to me. And then you have to be willing and have the humility to be misunderstood and not feel like you have to defend yourself to everybody that accuses you of something and let God fight your battles. Let God show you which battle you need to fight. But at the end of the day, if you and God are good, it will work out. So before we go any further, I want to encourage you in this. That you would say, God, I want your burden to be my burden. I want to fulfill the purpose you have for my life. I want my life to declare the kingdom of God. And the first step I need to do that is surrender my life to you. My fears, my insecurities, and allow you to use me in a powerful way. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. And everybody who's listening right now, if you would love to fulfill the prophetic purpose of your life. Everything God has for you, you want to live out. And that the burden of proof is that you laid your life down at the foot of the cross. And the evidence that God's burden, his passion, his preoccupations are yours you want that evidence to be clear in your life, that people see you, they see God. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, dear God, I surrender my life to you. I want to fulfill the purpose you have for my life. Fill me with the spirit of God. Reveal to me the path you want me to walk. Give me the courage to obey you even when it's scary. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to challenge you. Fulfill the burden of proof. Live a life that is, displays the glory of God in your life. Live a life when people see you, they see God. When they hear you, they hear God. When they watch you respond, they watch the spirit of God in your life. Before we go any further, I want you to watch this video because this video is a recap of our All In initiative and the one, some of the ways this church, the Rock Church, is trying to fulfill our prophetic purpose in San Diego and beyond. Check it out. In Matthew 28, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So you go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
This commission that Jesus gave his disciples has gripped my heart for years. Because the thing is, the missional church that Jesus describes here cannot be trapped within four walls. The missional church is a do-something church, a church that is so moved by compassion and so full of the love of Jesus that it cannot help but bless and serve the community that surrounds it. After years of praying for a permanent space in Chula Vista, we have finally found our new campus home. And this campus is gonna have four walls, yes, it's going to be a place for people to gather and worship and to fellowship with one another. But this is also going to be a church without walls, a church that engages the surrounding community and establishes pervasive hope on every street and every corner. Jesus deeply loves the people of Chula Vista and beyond, and we plan to relentlessly serve them as he would. 3.5 billion. According to a recent report, this is the number of searches performed on Google every single day. But here's a statistic that is even more interesting to me. During 2020, Google searches that began with the word why were higher than ever before. And this really makes sense. After a year of intense disruption, isolation, and anxiety, it's no surprise that people are scrolling, swiping, Googling, and trying to find meaning in the midst of all the chaos. And they're going to culture and to the digital world to find these answers. It's important for us to recognize that people are being shaped, formed, and even discipled by the stories that culture is telling them. This is a moment of profound opportunity, an opportunity to present people with a better story and to slice through the predominant cultural narrative with the truth of the Word of God. In 2020, we saw over 360,000 decisions for Christ online and were able to offer gospel presentations in English and Spanish to over 15 million people. We also launched Rock Your City last year, a broadcast in partnership with Fox 5 here in San Diego that highlights Rock Church's Do Something initiatives throughout the county. And in 2021, we are averaging over 250,000 people each week watching our Sunday services online. Jesus told his disciples that they were to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And in this digital age, the ends of the earth are more accessible to us than ever before. 20 years ago, I found this very chair on top of the Point Loma building before we owned it. I will go up on top of the roof, sit in this chair and pray over the city. This chair is a reminder of those prayers from 20 years ago and the calling that God put on our church to serve San Diego. Now, because of those prayers and God's faithfulness, we were able to purchase and shut down for good one of the most long-standing and iconic strip clubs in San Diego. Now it's time to transform it into a transitional living center, which women who have been survivors of trafficking and sex exploitation can receive hope, living skills, and pastoral support. Through the help of investors and donors, we were able to acquire the building and begin drawing up plans for what is called the Freedom Center. The Freedom Center will serve female survivors of human trafficking who are at least 18 years old. It will include counseling rooms, bedrooms, a kitchen, a laundry room, and more, and it will be able to house up to 120 women per year. We may look around this building and see broken glass, an old structure, and crumbling walls, but this building is not condemned to be torn down. It is to be renovated and repurposed. In the same way our brokenness, and we all have brokenness, is not beyond Jesus' desire and ability to restore. We serve a Jesus who was radical in the way he forgave, restored, and loved broken people. We believe that no area of town, no physical space, and no person is beyond the redemptive capacity of God's love. We get to partner with him as agents of transformation in our broken world. Please consider partnering with us, and God bless you. That was an amazing video. And, you know, we've been talking about the Do Something All In initiatives for this whole month, the Dream Center, where we're going to do all what you just saw. We're going to serve uh, San Diego through that building. It's an awesome opportunity. The Freedom Center, where lives are going to be transformed uh, through the Dream Center and um, helping survivors of human trafficking, which is so horrible beyond my comprehension. And then digital evangelism. We've been seeing a thousand people get saved every day all around the world. So this is a global 
outreach. And we want to give you the opportunity to join us financially. But let me get, take back to our um, mission and vision. Our mission is to save, equip, send. We want to get people saved, equip them, and send them out and do ministry, even if it's in their family, in the neighborhood. Uh, based on Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then the vision is something different. The vision is what happens when you fulfill your mission. It's the big dream. And it's established global pervasive hope that everywhere, everybody can have access to the gospel. But here's what comes from Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, your city, Judea, your state, Samaria, your country, and the ends of the earth. That is what we are trying to do. And that's what we want to invite you to join us uh, with your all-in offering. 100% of what you give will go, go to these initiatives. Obviously, money, uh, prayer, the Holy Spirit. But money will fuel these opportunities because it costs money. It's obvious. And so we want to give you, we know that God will put on your heart uh, the amount he wants you to give and if he wants you to give. But I'm going to pray for you as you consider this um, this generous gift towards the Do Something All In initiatives. And I want to pray that God would make it clear to you that he wants you to do it and what he wants you to do it and that you will be bold enough to trust what he says to you. You may be hearing something in your head like, are you real for real, God? Trust him. Trust him. My wife and I have been giving since we got saved in 1984 and God is faithful. So I want to pray for you, and I pray that God would encourage you to take a bold step and partner with us as we go out to save people whose lives are being destroyed. People right now who are on the verge of uh, being exploited on the street, homeless, losing their family, losing their business, losing their house, whatever it is. Or people who just need to know that Jesus loves them all around the world. That you will partner with us and partner with God as we partner with God to bring hope to them. So let me pray for you, and you can text the word all in to 52525, text all in to 52525, and we'll send you a link where you can make that generous tax-deductible donation. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the people who are going to invest in the kingdom right now. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you bring clarity to people, clarity in that they should give and what a number should be as you speak to them. And that it would be a faith number and they would take a step of faith and invest in your kingdom. Thank you for all the countless people have given the countless millions that we have spent on the community. Thank you so much. We honor you. We trust you. We know you call us to be generous. We know you call us to give. We know you call us to minister to the lost. And we will continue to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. If God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner. I know the penalty of my sin is death, and I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior, we want to know, and we want to email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared, and we want to send you some free resources. God bless you, and we'll see you in heaven.